Hey, this is a Hakawadi production. The world is a confusing place these days. In the Middle East, things are especially confusing as the younger generation straddles traditional conservative values of their parents with a tech-enabled, fast-paced lifestyle that's hard to resist. And then there's the fact that though Arabs are often all lumped together, there are deep cultural differences between all the countries that make up this part of the world. My guest today is known as the Confused Arab. He's a French-Algerian creative who's shown his work in Dubai, France, London, and Saudi Arabia. He seems to think that the key to our future is in our past. Please welcome Sofiane Simerabet. Hi, Sofiane. Hi, Nadia. So when you first founded the Confused Arab website a few years back, you explained that being confused kind of meant that you were questioning your heritage, um, your family memories and your surroundings. That's how you described it. And that you wanted to know more about who you are as an Arab and where Arab culture is going. Um, I like that image that you have on that page where you explain this that has a neon sign for a nightclub and right below it one for a mosque, which kind of Uh, illustrates some of the confusion that, you know, the new Arab uh, generation is facing. Um, it's been a few years now. A lot has happened in the Arab world. Are you more confused or less confused? So uh, thank you very much for asking the question, Nadia. You started to mention the art piece by French Algerian artist Kader Atia with the mosque and club. really uh, identify myself to this piece uh, a few years back because my my weekends were basically between going Friday to the mosque and then after going to clubs and really have fun at the same time. I think that things have changed in my life and things have changed also in the Arab world and in the diaspora. The idea behind the Confused Arab was to take curiosity as an opportunity for all of us Arabs and non-Arabs to know better the region and to know the regions because I mean it's just it's not just one region but also just to allow yourself to question things which are kind of established or established by people and uh, even though a lot of things have changed in the region this remains very important to keep the curiosity the intellectual curiosity to always challenge things which are given So now you're the curious Arab <laughs> and confused. <laughs> uh, I like the word curious, actually, because, I mean, curious has several meanings as confused. Confused was used as a way to express confusion, not in its first sense of being lost, even though uh, being lost is not always bad. Confusion was also a way to express the fact of searching for something. So I liked curiosity because curiosity has this double sense between being curious as weird and you know that it's always good to stay weird and curiosity as looking, searching for more information. Ooh, I like that. Um, you talk a lot about nostalgia. That's been kind of a recurring theme. What exactly are you nostalgic for? And do you think things were better in the past in the Arab world? So nostalgia has, I mean, the notion of nostalgia has been uh, romanticized lately, you know, I mean, and not just lately, like historically, when we're talking about nostalgia, it's about, let's say, this pain of, of home. Like when you, you look at the Greek etymology, etymology, so nostalgia comes from pain and home. It's very interesting because in Arabic, uh, we use another word called hanin, And Hanin uh, has a complete different meaning. Hanin is close to Al-Han and to, it's closer to a feeling. So nostalgia is not always something painful in Arabic. Nostalgia is something you feel, like naturally, as a, as a, as a sentiment. My parents are very important to me because, I mean, I left home very early and I kind of identify myself to some extent, to them, because, I mean, they left Algeria very young, then after they came back to Algeria, then after they left again. And I think that the fact of leaving France was, to some extent, leaving also this uh, immigrant, uh, following this immigrant uh, path, I mean, in completely different conditions. But um, nostalgia in general, and I have more and more issue with this word alone. It's why I always speak about the future of nostalgia, 
because nostalgia alone is a filter. It's a filter for Arabs. It's a filter uh, in every culture, but it's a filter in the way Arabs do uh, see their heritage or, let's say, political and social uh, situations. People will remember things that they want to remember. And when we speak about social constructions, as uh, when we say the Arabs, the Muslims, the Middle Easterns, the North Africans, we do use social construction. And this social construction, when they are linked to nostalgia uh, as a group, they do choose to remember specific things. And very often the thing that they want to remember are not always that we're in touch with the reality at that time. Do you have an example Am of I that? clear or not? Yes, but do you have an example? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, very often, you know, people will share pictures of, um, it's something you can find very often on social media. People will, will share pictures of women in the streets of Cairo, for example, in the 50s, women in the streets of ba Baghdad, women in the streets of Algiers, in a very modern, or I would say, uh, a very free, free way. So when people are using these pictures, they tend to see that, I mean, they, they want to convey a special message saying, yeah, look, we used to be much progressive before. The problem is that it's just one side of the story, or I would say just one visible part of the iceberg. Because at that time, let's say, the, the, the literacy rate of women was much lower. Women were not that integrated to the society. They didn't have the level of responsibilities that they have now in the region. So I completely do agree that we can look at something saying that, oh, look, it was great at that time. But then we have always just to put things into context. It's the same thing, for example, if we're talking about economic development. People will always share like uh, very clean, nice pictures of cities, of Arab cities in the 70s or, or 60s. I agree on the picture, it looks amazing. But then let's say that you can't just say, yeah, look what happened now without thinking about the political changes, without thinking about the social also changes which, which happened at that time with uh, people from, let's say, countryside coming to the cities. Let's say, for example, if you look at Iraq or even uh, Syria, like the political and, uh, and global, um, I wouldn't say just global, let's say uh, the Western uh, intervention interventionism uh, in, in these countries. So, I mean, you always have to, to keep an eye on the context. You showcase a lot of Arab talent on your platform. What's the reason behind that? I'm very proud of the level of creativity that we have in our regions. I think that creativity is really something which can put the region forward a lot. Creativity can sound sometimes as, a, as an empty word, but I mean that uh, art, design, uh, architecture, photography, I think that the level of talent that you have in Arab countries, in addition to uh, the diaspora, is something that I really want to share with people because very often when we, when we think about what is being an Arab today, people tend just to think about negative elements or political violences or discriminations. Or, so I'm not negating all of that, but I just want to show that some people are really badass and they are really doing an amazing job. Is there more talent in the Arab world? I wouldn't, I mean, uh, it would be pretentious to say that there, that there is like more, uh, more talent in the Arab world than somewhere else. First of all, I mean, I, I know you haven't asked the question, but it's always good to repeat it just to come back on this. Um, What is being an Arab today? It's not like just living in an Arab country. What is, a, what is considered an Arab country uh, is sometimes discussed. But let's say that you have different faces of the Arab world. Uh, you have, let's say, uh, North Africa. And even in North Africa, you have big differences between Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia. You have uh, Libya, you have Egypt. Then after the Gulf is also living in a completely different situation compared to uh, the rest of uh, Arab countries, the Levant, Yemen or Iraq. Uh, so first of all, when I'm um, appreciating Arab talents, I'm appreciating the, the variety and the diversity that we have in this region. Uh, I don't want to sound pan-Arab uh, pan or 
because I mean, I, I really don't believe in, in this ideology, but I'm very happy to see that there is a lot of things uniting people from the Gulf to the ocean. But at the same time, there is a lot of local diversity. And if you want, um, when it comes to some some countries, let's say, especially countries in which you have a big political unrest now, internally or internationally, I mean, you have to acknowledge that when your country is being on the verge of destruction or not just on the verge, like being destroyed completely, it takes a lot of courage to decide to go on being an artist, a musician, a painter, to be creative. Because, I mean, sometimes we forget that we tend to think that creative is a luxury, but these countries are just showing us, I mean, our countries are showing us that, no, it's an essential, an essential part of ourselves. You've been very supportive of the Black Lives Matter movement on your social media. Do you think there's any real problem with racism in the Middle East? Uh, I do think that there is a, a deep racism problem in the Middle East and North Africa during the Black Lives Matter Uh, during the birth, let's say, of the Black Lives Matter question, uh, I really wanted just to tackle the issue differently depending on the background of, of every Arab. So it's why, uh, I don't know if you remember, but I have a post on which actually I'm just, I'm really uh, targeting uh, the issue differently depending on if you are from the Gulf, if you are from the Levant, if you're Egyptian, or if you're like North African. Because the... Um, The black question in the Arab world is very actual and is uh, unfortunately still a, a reality. Uh, however, it, it does not appear in the same way. Let's say that when we're talking about the black racism in, uh, in North Africa, very often people natively will tell you about uh, migrants which is a very hypocritical uh, point because you have native black North African, um, let's say Algerian, Moroccans or, or Tunisians, but people will always tell you about uh, migrants. When you're talking about the Levant or, or the Gulf, people will very often speak about home staff, you know, like people, uh, helpers and people really like uh, helping uh, at home. And again, it's, I think it's... Um, It depends on the country because, I mean, in Lebanon, you had the Kafala system at that time, which I think has been um, amended slightly. In the Gulf, uh, like for North Africa, you have a quite important native part of the population being black. I just think that all countries, all Arab countries need to also, when I'm talking about countries, I think that it comes from the population, but also from authorities, uh, I think that authorities also need to uh, integrate better black history in the national uh, component. When you look at what's happening in countries like the UAE and Saudi Arabia, where there's a concerted effort to kind of fast track into the future uh, with technology, especially, but even with culture, are you worried at all that Arab culture will lose its flavor over time or that maybe there's some kind of disconnect between the new reality and the old reality that doesn't add up? Yeah, I think that you can keep strongly your identity without compromising on the ways of how expressing it. I think that what we're seeing now in the Gulf, so you mentioned Saudi Arabia or the UAE, is not against local identities. I think that on the contrary, the fact of being able to modernize the way to communicate or to display your identity can actually make the youth being even more attached and prouder of being part of this identity. One of the key elements for me uh, when it comes to Arab identities, because I mean, we have uh, several identities in the region, is the language. And I can see that It's very important always for authorities to keep defending Arabic language. And it's very interesting the way it's done differently on the countries. So let's say, for example, in the UAE being a, a very open and international destination, English is, is widely used everywhere, even though like some people think that they don't need Arabic, which I think is, uh, is completely false because uh, wrong, because... 
Uh, English can help you just to stay one year, two years, but then after, if you really want to know where you are, if you really want to uh, be closer to people living in the country, I mean, Arabic, but also, let's say, Urdu or Tagalog uh, might be uh, super useful. I think that, yeah, uh, several activities have been done by cultural local uh, authorities. So, for example, um, you have the, the Ministry of Culture who um, decided, let's say, to celebrate the birth of the prophet the way it used to be done before uh, in a very Emirati way. It's called the Maulid. But at the same time, they are opening the celebration to all of the celebration worldwide, like in the Muslim world. And it's very interesting because it's really celebrating local heritage, not mixing it, but also, let's say, uh, using it as a way to globalize your culture. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and best of luck with your new projects. Thank you. That's it. You can follow The Confused Arab on Instagram or check out the website, theconfusedarab.com. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast platform so you'll know when a new episode is out. See you soon.